So in the last video, I neglected to measure the angularity requirement on the angle block. So let's do that. Right now, the requirement says angularity of 5,000 to datum B. So to set that up, we're going to take datum B and we're going to set it up on a sign bar and raise it to 40 degrees for a subtraction measurement. So let's do that. Now, if you haven't watched the video on uh, angle measurement and sign bars, uh, you may want to check out that to get more info. But uh, in order to figure out how much of a Joe block stack to make, we're going to do a simple equation. We're going to do 5 times the sine of 40, because we have a 5-inch bar, 3.2139 and some change. So we need to get to 0.2139. So we're going to use the 0 0.1009 and the 0 0.113 and we'll assemble them together like this, make a little cross and then twist. And then we need the three inch. So we will assemble this together and Now normally I'd verify these stacks, but I've been using these blocks all week and haven't had any issue. And I'm gonna just trust them. All right, so we've got our 40 degree angle. We're gonna take our, our datum B surface and put it very gently on the sign bar, like so. Don't wanna knock anything over. Now we're going to bring up our indicator and we're going to zero on one corner. Okay. And then we're going to sweep. We're going to look for some air. So I'm going to sweep all around and man, it's, it's really not a lot of air. It's really, really tight um, tolerance and held very tight as well. So it was about half a thousandth of air and we had a tolerance zone of 5,000. So this is that same flat you know, surface tolerance zone I showed you earlier, just like perpendicularity and parallelism. You get a tolerance zone up or down for, for what you're registering. Um, we knew it was a 40 degree angle because the print calls for a 40 degree reference angle and you maybe you've noticed on some of the images I've shown you in the prints there's a box around the 40 degrees and I never really explained what that box is so let me do that now I should have done that earlier but when you see a box around 40 degrees or or around some of the whole location numbers that's basically telling you uh, those features that are boxed are no longer controlled by the title block but they have a GDNT control frame associated with them somewhere on the print. So it's kind of a visual indicator to say, do not apply the title block tolerance to this feature, apply the, uh, apply the uh, feature control frame uh, tolerance. My apologies. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. But sticking with this angle, this 40 degree angle, by verifying that my indicator didn't move within five degrees and I set up a 40 degree angle with the sign bar, I've pretty much verified that the angle is 40 degrees at the same time as verifying the angularity requirement. Now, if, if it weren't machined at 40 degrees, if it 41 or 45 or something drastic, you would have seen that indicator move very quickly and very steadily in one direction or the other. But we had almost no movement, there was no pattern, so we know it was machined at 40. We certainly could grab that bevel protractor on the, on the desk there and, and try to verify it that way, but it really it has no meaning anymore once that box goes around it on the title, on the, around the 40 degree requirement, it becomes controlled by the, uh, by the feature control frame. So keep that in mind and continuing on that discussion, about the box, you know, it also applies to the true position requirements. So let's find our print that has true position 
on it. So right here, we have a true position 14 and you know datums involved. And you'll see the this hole here is positioned by this 2.5 in X and this 0.5 in Y. They also have a box and it's the same as I just mentioned. It's a visual indicator that these dimensions are, are controlled by a feature control frame. You'll also probably notice that this hole here is on the same line as the 2.5 and this hole here is on the same line as the 0.5. And that's because, you know, when we're making engineering drawings, you know, we're taught to be as efficient as we can about uh, using these callouts so that we're not cluttering up the, the drawing so much. And as a result of that, sometimes we overlap our callouts and... Oh, we're already good. Uh, we overlap our callouts and they apply to multiple holes and you're just going to have to to recognize that you'll see that this set of holes has no true position uh, associated with it and this one does not either so this 0.500 will get the title block tolerance just for this hole and this hole will get the title block tolerance for the 2.5 but this hole does not get title block it only gets true position requirement. So if you're not understanding that, you know, inspect a bunch of holes and sooner or later you'll get used to it. If you think about it, like if you had a whole pattern, maybe some bolts needed to assemble, uh, you would apply a true position to give yourself the most tolerance for those bolts to assemble. Then you might also have some circles that just are clearance for other parts. Maybe it's cables, maybe it's just clearance parts, clearance shafts, whatever. Um, and they happen to be in line because, you know, the design is fairly symmetric and, and the holes are all in line. So they're going to reuse the same coordinate systems for some of these holes. And some of them are going to have true position. Some of them are not, but likely many of them will, be, will have boxes around them, many of the position features. So you just have to get used to it. But um, eventually it, it becomes second nature when you work with true position enough. You'll recognize it right away. So... Last thing I forgot to mention, uh, this is kind of my cleanup video. Um, earlier on, I mentioned that the datums can, you know, datum A, B, and C are, are supposed to be assigned by importance. So datum A is your most important uh, feature for assembly, for function, then datum B, datum C, and so on. Well, when you're looking at a feature control frame, in fact, those letters are sometimes out of alphabetical order because for that particular feature, it may be, you know, I don't have an example up here right now, but if it said C and then B, it might be that uh, datum C is more important than the others for this particular feature and this particular datum. Sometimes parts get a little complicated. They have a lot of datums and they have multiple functions, multiple assemblies. So Sometimes you'll see these things out of order because for that particular case, it's more important for this feature to be referenced to the third or fourth datum and not necessarily the first datum. So you might see them out of order. You might see CAB or CBA or, or whatever, BAC. I've seen it a few times, not, not terribly often, but again, it was on those more complex uh, callouts that, that I have seen it before. So. Um, don't be surprised if you see that. Just follow what the feature control frame says and, and that goes into setting up your, uh, your block using the high points of the surface plate and the angle blocks. It kind of follows along that, uh, that discussion So um, with the 3 two, one setup. So keep that in mind. But for now, we're, we're pretty much done with our cleanup and we're, we're going we're gonna to close with a few discussions on the GD&T rules. So a lot of people, when they're learning GD&T, they get taught this at the beginning before they learn the symbols. And I really like to teach it after the symbols so that you can have some context. Uh, put these, you know, you can, you can visualize what this might mean for each symbol. So let's go over rule number one, the individual feature of size. When only size tolerances are noted, for example, a plus or minus five title block, the tolerance controls the size error and the form error. So for, in effect, you have a GD&T form error is implied but not stated. Now that can be confusing, that can be frustrating, 
that can cause problems where you're, you're rejecting something that it's not on the print, but it is actually implied on the print. It's just like when you look at a print and there's no 90 degree angles um, on, uh, on edges and you know they're 90 degrees and if they weren't 90 degrees, you would reject the part. So it's, it's along that line of thinking. If we look at this example in particular, you know, if we had an elliptical diameter, you know, very elliptical that is supposed to be round, this is a bit of an exaggeration. And you took this one inch plus or minus five and okay, you plotted, here's the 0.995 diameter, here's the 1.005 diameter, and here's where our diameter fits in relation to that. Well, you would reject this right away um, because, you know, your calipers would probably pick up, oh yeah, some points are, are large, some points are small, right? They're large and small here. If you went all the way around, there's, they're out of tolerance here, on the inside of tolerance, well, out of spec here. But I, I want to caution people because sometimes, depending on the gauge you're using, you may or may not pick this up. You know, a three-point hole mic may or may not pick it up. Um, if you're not using a caliper in enough places, there are some places along this diameter that are in spec, so you may not pick it up if you're not picking enough places. But in particular, a CMM, I wanted to, I want to mention that in particular. By default, a CMM is going to report the average diameter, like this uh, dotted line here. And that's all. It's going to say, look, the, the average is intolerance. And by default, it doesn't tell you anything extra. And you can program it to tell you extra or, or bring up those details. But in my experience with the CMMs I've used, it's always been a little of an extra step at the programming side. And so it just means you pay a little bit more attention. People tend to put a lot of faith in the CMM. And this is one area where it's human error. You can CMM could measure the part correctly with the probe, but you didn't program it to report all of the requirements, even the implied ones. Now, I haven't used every software, I haven't used every CMM, but it, I've talked to some people and they, you know, they agree with me that it's something you need to pay attention to, especially with a tight tolerance. Program those lows and highs, have it report that. Um, with an open tolerance, it may not be as big an issue. Uh, but with a closed tolerance, it, sh it is. But what you should see you know, on the right side here, what you should see is that all of your points are in your tolerance zone, no matter where you are. Um, this is kind of an exaggeration of, of, of the diameter, but uh, zoomed in. But, you know, it's all intolerance. No matter how bad that shape looks, it's all intolerance. And that's that's what we're looking for with GD&T Formair. If you were using a, a caliper, even forget the size requirement. If you use the caliper and you went around and you had a bunch of variation greater than the 10 thousandths window, you could reject it just based on that. It wouldn't even matter what size everything was. If you got more than 10 thousandths of variation, you, you can reject it because you, there's no way you could fit all of that error inside of a 10 thousandths window. And that's something you might see with an indicator when you're doing some runout checks. If you're like, whoa, this is running out way too much. That is a diameter issue at the same time. They're related. Um, or it could be bent, you know, tapered. It's not always a diameter issue, but it could be. So, um, that's individual feature size, individual feature of size. And then next up we have rule number two, which is regardless of feature size. And what this says is that the GD&T tolerance applies to the feature everywhere, no matter how big or how small the part is. So for example, we have parallel 0 0.005 to A. And if we remember from our angle block print, datum A is, is back here, this surface. So if we were going to do a parallelism check, say, to the top surface, we would have five thousandths of tolerance. But if the part grows, same design, just scaled up, and they don't change the tolerance, we still only have five thousandths, no matter how much bigger the part got. Unless somebody changed the tolerance in the software, um, you have to apply that same tolerance. I've seen some people say, you know, well, what is it every six inches? What is it every... 12 inches, do you maintain five within every 12? And 
sometimes that's true, but there's a growing trend or there's a waviness and that doesn't count. You know, it's, it's gotta be everywhere. So this is by default at all times. It doesn't need to be called out. You're not gonna see a special call out. You might see an MMC or an LMC for maximum material or least material condition. And that will give you some bonus. That, that's typically in a situation where, you know, again, you're kind of assembling something. And if you cut away at something, then you will be able to uh, maintain the, um, you know, you'll be able to still clear the, clear the fit. Whatever the, whatever the fit is, uh, that might give you some bonus tolerance. But I actually haven't seen that very often. So I, think of, I can only think of one time where I, I saw that. Uh, it's pretty rare. So if you, if you come across it in your industry, in your job, just study the call out uh, closely. And, um, you know, that, that, that bonus tolerance is going gonna, is gonna to be dependent on, on some feature size as well. So keep that in mind. Um, now, there is a rule three that we'll, we weren't, we're really not going to talk about in this video. It has to do with threads. And rule three says uh, when you're designing threads or you know, inspecting threads, basically everything is, is dependent on the pitch diameter and it defines the pitch diameter there, uh, you know, which we, we said is, the, is when the root, uh, sorry, when the, when the peak and the valley uh, thickness is the same. That's the pitch diameter. And that's roughly 50% of the way from the root to the crest. That's all it really says. It just says, do all of your designs and tolerancing off of the pitch diameter. So we talked about that a lot in the thread inspection videos, and I don't see a reason to, to bring it up now, but in case you're wondering. Um, let's see. At this point, I would normally, you know, break out some practice exercise videos and questions and things to do, but this video a little bit different than my other ones. I, I basically did the practice exercises while I explained the topics back and forth. And I really don't have anything new to show you. So, or have you do, I would say just grab a part, grab a print, study the call outs and, and practice with the tools that you have. Um, and then answer these questions, you know, do you understand the symbols? Do you know what they mean? Do you have them memorized? Do you have a quick cheat sheet nearby? Can you read the feature control frame, all the pieces? Do you understand it? Datums, um, sorry, uh, symbols first, then tolerances, modifiers, and datums. Can you find the datums, not just in the feature control frame, but on the print? Sometimes prints get big and complicated and they can be difficult to find. They might be on other pages and that can be a mess sometimes, but can you find them? Do you recognize them? Once you feel like you're good with the blueprints, uh, blueprints. Uh, start practicing. Start measuring your your GD and T. Um, are you referencing the proper datums in the you know A, B, and C? Are you setting them up on the rock correctly? Do you need to do a special three, two, one setup or not? Like I said, I, I don't I don't always follow that rule because there are ways to to verify that you know things are pretty good good enough for you not to require it by checking how square everything is in parallel. But sometimes you really need to when it's tight tolerance, you may need to take the extra steps to really fixture this thing. Um, do you have good technique with the indicators? Are you sweeping zero, finding the high points correctly? Are you using the shot math correctly? If you're involving pins, are you using the radius uh, correctly? And then practice interpreting your results once you have you know, a TIR and you know, you're rotating the parts. Does it make sense? Is it what you expected? Uh, maybe is there an issue or what's the issue? Diameter, run out, what's, you know, size, position, what's, what's, what's the root cause? What's the main driver of, of what you're seeing on the surface plate or with your hand tools? Um, and do you understand the difference between GD and T tolerance zones and traditional tolerance zones? So when GD and T is involved, you can take those traditional tolerances, throw them out the window and just use the feature control frame tolerances but you still use the nominal locations to help you choose your gauges, choose the size of the micrometers you're gonna be using and such, uh, set up your sign bars as you saw, but all the tolerances come from the feature control frame. 
Um, well, I think that's it for me. Um, please uh, check out my website, pragmaticmetrology.com, for more videos like this. I definitely am planning to do a deeper dive into true position or position. Uh, I have a calculator that will demonstrate the concept of position and circular tolerance zone and maximum material condition, bonus tolerances, all that. I have a, I have a calculator uh, I'll record a video for. It will help explain that a lot better than I could otherwise. So uh, look for that video there. Look for other videos on gauges, on concepts, um, anything that will, that will help you in your careers and as, an, as an inspector learning about metrology. And I do want to take my, my quick moment to thank uh, Laney College to let me use some of these parts here to demonstrate these videos. They have a really great program for CNC machining, manual machining, um, metrology, of course, blueprints, uh, CAD design, maintenance. I think they have more courses I can't remember. Um, they also have certificates that you can earn, like inspector or or machinist if you take enough courses. Maybe it's manual machinist. Um, they have uh, an associate's degree, you know, if you stay for the, the two years and take all the courses. And apprenticeship programs, you know, they're involved with apprenticeship programs, local companies, so you can do your, your classes there. Um, so that's Laney Machine Technology in Oakland, California. So if you're in the Northern California, Bay Area, uh, check them out, they've got a great program there. Um, that's Laney. So um, thank you guys for watching this video. I appreciate it. I hope you liked it. I hope you check out my other ones and um, I'll see you for the next one. Thanks.